So our next speaker is uh, Jonas Forslund, who together with two colleagues at the Royal Institute of Technology and uh, Stanford University have implemented wooden haptics. Jonas, looking forward. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about uh, the wooden haptics project. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say that I'm extra happy to present it here at Stanford University. Uh, while my, I'm a PhD student at KTH in Sweden, I was fortunate to also be spending some time here in Professor Ken Salisbury's lab. Uh, I don't have any robotics background, but being immersed in this lab gave me an opportunity to learn a lot about, about the tacit skills involved in robotics, through which I could pick up all the bits and pieces needed to make something that, uh, like this that I'm presenting uh, today. Uh, the knowledge required to do this was uh, ac accessible in this lab, uh, while quite inaccessible in my home lab, and it's not so easy to transfer. And von Hippel, he calls this uh, stickiness, in that the knowledge is sticky to the environment where it was created. So the aim for this paper uh, today uh, is to reduce this stickiness in order to enable other interaction designers to craft spatial haptic devices and to explore their design space. Uh, the way we do this is through a starting kit. Uh, the kit that we propose not only let the designer fabricate a fully working haptic device, it also allows for easy modification in shape and size, as well as tuning the parameters to fit a particular task or application. Uh, this is important for interaction designers who want to work with this material, so we can shape the experiential qualities it affords. But uh, first recap what grounded spatial haptics is, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, so, so here is an example of an application uh, that uses a grounded spatial haptic device to explore the shape and size of a tumor. Um, <clears throat> the user can move a manipulandum or handle uh, in space and see a corresponding avatar on the screen. Through the device, it's possible to feel uh, the contact with the object on the screen in a very direct and real sense. Uh, we heard in the keynote about Lederman and Klatsky's uh, explorative procedures, and here we are using one of those, the contour following, uh, to identify the shape and location of a tumor uh, surrounded by uh, blood vessels. Okay. Uh, we have here. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so uh, there are, uh, of course, other kinds of uh, uh, haptic feedback, like vibrotactile, that uh, we all have in our phones. But uh, today, and uh, we are only, uh, well, for me at least, <laughs> only interested in the grounded spatial ones. Uh, what signifies them are, are that, of course, they are uh, grounded, which means they sit on your table and you cannot move them around. Uh, they are spatial in that the manipulandum or handle is moved in space uh, and tracked in space with at least three degrees of freedom. And they can re reflect the directional force onto the manipulandum that is used to give haptic uh, feedback. Uh, so the second, third, and fourth device in these pictures are serially linked mechanisms, and that was made popular for haptics by Massey and Salisbury back in 1994. Uh, and I always wonder why haven't we seen more of these uh, uh, desi uh, devices? Um, and what is important also for an interaction designer is to know that these devices not only differ in shape and form, but also the haptic feedback quality di differs significantly between them. Uh, the feeling can be described as mushy or crisp, strong or soft, and so on. And I will give one example in this quick overview of haptic rendering. So here we are uh, rendering a, a teapot, and <clears throat> the avatar follows uh, the device manipulandum position uh, as we approach the teapot. And as we come in uh, contact with it, we maintain the, the avatar um, visually on the surface uh, and then let the manipulandum penetrate the surface and then we attach a virtual spring between these two uh, and the force is proportional uh, to the distance between them. And this uh, force is displayed to the user through um, the linked mechanism through the motor here uh, and displayed at the tip of the uh, instrument. And now uh, the quality of that feedback is dependent both on structural qualities but not the least on motor qualities. So if 
you have a strong uh, and high quality motor, uh, very stiff feeling can be produced. Uh, likewise, with lower quality motors, you can get kind of a mushy feeling or a similar. One of the purposes of our starting kit is to give designers a heightened sensitivity to these qualities through direct experimentation starting with a hackable default design. Uh, so, uh, to open up uh, the design space uh, without ha having access to a fabulous electromechanical lab, uh, we propose this starting kit called Wooden Haptics. And this allows an interaction designer to manufacture and assemble a fully working spatial haptic device. The drawings and schematics of this kit is available as open source and can be produced using personal fabrication methods. Uh, with these parts, a default design can be assembled. I'm gonna see it here. All right. Uh, so what we see here uh, is a recording uh, from the first study in our paper that seeks to answer the question, uh, to what extent could someone without robotics training or access to a sophisticated lab use the kit, assemble the device, and make it work? And the starting point for this assembly uh, is the laser-cut plywood parts, hardware parts that can be ordered online, an electronics box and software pre-made by the authors, and uh, the assembly took 11 hours, was done under guidance of someone more experienced, but it shows at least that it is realistic that someone uh, that have no formal robotics training can put it together. And once assembled, uh, the user can, or the dis user designer, can start experimenting with different versions of the design. And some things you, you, you see here, although maybe you have to look it, at it again, um, is that we use pins to uh, uh, stack the plywood parts very accurately. Uh, we use this uh, wire rope instead of uh, gears and, and so on that uh, makes very uh, good contact between, or power transmission between the motors and the end effector. Uh, and yeah, we're doing it a bit more rapidly than in the 11 hours it takes. Uh, but you can learn to do this. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite doable. I'm just going to say to finish it up very quick, very soon here. Actually, this part we see right here is from uh, the flight um, hobbyist uh, movement, or they, they have very good tools that we can use uh, for tensioning that, uh, that final link. All these cables need to be tensioned in order to the, for the power transmission to work. And here we see we're adding the motors at the last stage, and that's one uh, big difference from if you would just hack uh, an off-the-shelf haptic device, in that the, those motors will normally be hidden deep inside the device, and here you can actually uh, switch them and replace them with another motor just to experience that difference I talked about before. Uh, so. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, making the device work without the kit uh, would involve much problem solving. For example, forming equations for calculating the position of the device and correct torque to apply to the motors and implementing this in electronics and software. Uh, for mechanics, there are several important nuances mentioned in the paper that I will not uh, go into deeply here, but the choice of structure, power transmission, even which type of screws uh, used do matter. And locating and purchasing these parts is not so trivial either. Uh, therefore, we have aimed to reducing the, this engineering work as much as possible for the design user through modules and pre-selected components that are all listed online. Um, the modules is uh, this electronics box and software where the designer only has to specify the length of the arms and a few other documented properties. So the first study we did was can you build it? And the second study was what can we actually uh, adapt it or change it? Um, uh, so 
we, we did some experimentation with the design and then we quantitatively measured some well-known haptic device properties and compared them with commercial devices. So here to the left we see a smaller version that uses the same structure but shorter arms. And this demonstrates that the, factor, uh, the form factor can easily be changed. To the right is a version where the end uh, arm has been fabricated using a lathe uh, instead of a laser cutter. Uh, this demonstrates the ability to combine traditional crafting methods uh, <clears throat> together with the other components. In all, it helps reducing the feeling of kind of respect for the technology inspire creative experimentation. Um, but measuring the uh, workspace peak force, uh, the continuous force and friction, we can see here that in these uh, different devices, um, no one has um, uh, the largest workspace force or minimum friction altogether. There are trade-offs involved. <clears throat> so when the device is made with shorter arms, the workspace naturally decreases, but you get uh, higher force and so on. This shows the benefit for hardware sketching where one very quickly can try out alternation without changing electronics, software, or larger parts of the mechanics than is necessary. So does this homemade device work well in reality? Well, we performed a study with uh, 10 participants that got to judge the haptic qualities of the device and compare it with some commercially produced devices. And you can also judge for yourself later uh, in the demo. Um, so the participants, they got to try them all and then rate them one by one on a one to seven Likert scale in four dimensions. And the sum of, or the result of the sum uh, shows that the wooden haptics device was rated somewhere between the phantom omnium and phantom desktop. And we uh, also asked the participants to, to draw a line between the wooden haptics device and the three commercial ones uh, to uh, answer the question which one were they thought were most similar in their feeling. And seven out of 10 selected the Phantom Desktop, which is a quite um, nice result given that that device cost about $10,000. So why? <coughs> Uh, why, right? So in summary, we made a device that can be assembled by an interaction designer that generates haptic feedback on par with at least mid-range commercial haptic devices and that designers can alter. But why is this important? For one thing, uh, haptic devices and application programming interfaces sometimes give wrong expectation of what experiential qualities they support. For example, uh, Mosset noted that hardware hard is relative. Uh, from his experiment uh, with a commercial haptic device where a virtual object specified to be of maximum stiffness still yielded a sensation he referred to as mushy hard. Um, it is important that we as interaction designers working with haptics are able to consciously design the haptic parameters. Different motors have different power and thus different stiffness can be provided. While it's the not, that alone is not a full story, by building and experimenting hands-on, we can learn how these parameters affect the experiential qualities of the end product. Uh, this allows a designer to decide what motors, workspace, and aesthetics are suitable for a specific task or a specific experience. Uh, and we have talked uh, a bit today about open source hardware and, and um, Open source hardware designed for personal fabrication has also been described as an uh, approach to support designers um, of <coughs> support design of different aspects of electronic products. Uh, since the designers only had to modify those parts of design pertinent to the designer's interest and still get a working product. So, <coughs> so with a wooden haptic device, you can change only the thing you are interested in, in changing. So obviously this is something we want to promote too. Uh, with the word starting kit, we want to communicate that this is uh, everything and all you need to get started with designing spatial haptic devices. While you can build, only build one device um, with the parts in the kit, you are very well prepared to continue adding or removing parts when you are ready. The kit also designed, uh, is also designed with modifiability in mind 
uh, for example, to easily replace motors. Uh, since the plywood parts are made for uh, personal fabrication methods, it's also quite straightforward to modify them in CAD software or using handicraft methods. So, most importantly, the kit freezes the de designer from solving many electrical, mechanical, and computational problems since these have already been solved for her. It instead allows the designer uh, to innovate in terms of motor choices, workspace dimensions, uh, physical material, aesthetics, and extended functions like buttons. Finally, uh, it enables designers to add a personal touch to the devices they incorporate in their projects. Uh, there are certainly opportunities in terms of different aesthetics, which of course is not limited to looks, but uh, uh, also includes the feel of different materials and shapes. So these are the two different variants I made so far, but we can also see in the future different ones with um, uh, more buttons or other inputs and uh, adding vibrotactile actuators for higher frequency feedback, uh, different grips or end attachment, for example, dental drill. I uh, um, can acknowledge that many have done before this kind of modification using the off-the-shelf devices, and I think this, uh, our work could uh, uh, help them do more of that. Uh, so, very welcome to the demo and also welcome to the woodenheartist.org website where all the schematics and CAD models and everything is uploaded. Thank you. Very impressive work. Uh, do we have questions? Okay, I'll start off. I, uh, good, as we, uh, let me go ahead there. Hi, Danny Lashbrook from the Rochester Institute of Technology. I'm in the middle of assembling a, a Shepoko a CNC router, which is quite a painful task. Um, but I noticed that a lot of their parts are stamped out of metal and are very rigid. And I'm curious um, if you've thought about taking it a little bit step further, maybe making it less easy to do in a laser cutter, but making it fewer parts, a little bit less assembly, um, to make it easier in general to put together. Um. Yeah, that's a, a, a good question, and I uh, certainly can see you make the parts in uh, with 3D printing or uh, other methods. Um, then, um, for me personally, I, I really like this working uh, with wood and, and laser cutter. It's very very flexible, um, and uh, it's uh, easy to change parts, and you have ready uh, access to it. So. Um, uh, but but I, I can certainly see uh, uh, both, uh, and I think we will see uh, kits using basically the same electronics and so on, uh, but using other uh, parts fabricated with other methods. So uh, uh, for another question, while we wait for others to come up, uh, I really enjoyed your mentioning of variations of different physical forms with the end effectors, other kinds of input or output integrated there. If in a next variation you were really focusing on that dimension um, and trying to think of an application domain that you wanted to sort of co-target with that, it could be entertainment, it could be surgery, there are a lot that have been targeted here. Do you have a sense if, if the constraint was that you were really to focus on the physical form and the other kinds of input-output modalities of the end effector. Um, any thoughts on what you might target and why? Um, well, uh, I'm, I was smiling there because I'm, I'm making also a, a dental simulator. So obviously I would like to incorporate this into that. Uh, and there I can see that you could, would want to like attach a dental drill uh, with a tube going out or so, things like that you can um, easily do. Um, but there, there are lots of creative uh, ideas. I've seen people putting like a um, glue, uh, one of those glue sticks things there to it and, and creating art with, with um, using it as a robotic controller more. Um, so we, we can see lots of um, different uses. Super. Well, and I agree with you that uh, while well, I see benefits and trade-offs of any many other uh, 3D fab and other techniques, uh, the choice of medium as message, uh, influence of medium as message from McLuhan, your choice of wood really seems to encourage people to get creative, modify even the free space that you've added in between to run wires and other sorts of elements. Uh, it's really exciting work. 
Any uh, last question or? Okay, then let's give another round of applause. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, for the wood, I should not take the credit uh, alone because that that was a common practice here uh, in Salisbury's lab. So, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's give another round of applause.